Greetings all, and welcome to the 17th episode of the VTP, or the Veteran Trainer's Perspective. Today, we're going to be covering an aspect of the Pokemon world that is often taken for granted, but when examined in real world terms, shows that the lovely world that we put ourselves into every time we boot up a cartridge or disc, might not be as ecologically stable as some would like to think. Today, we are going to be taking a look at the unstable situation that is the global diversity of Pokemon, and what can be done to rectify the issues that are present in the natural balance of the world. Since the very beginning of this franchise's existence, the adage of the day has always been to catch them all, and back when things first started out, it seemed like a daunting task with 151 different types of Pokemon to capture. Today, as of Generation 8, that number has jumped to a staggering 898 different types of Pokemon to find and collect, and the challenge to get them all has never been greater, even with all the advancements that have come to make trading much easier for most. It is a mark of distinction to be able to complete the National Pokédex and declare yourself a Pokémon Master, but the desire to be one has always been there for many, even if they might have only been playing through it casually to some degree or another. These creatures occupy all sorts of habitats and environments across the globe and are widespread enough that there is no telling what you might find just by peeking around the corner of your home or local area. Some of them fun and playful, others powerful and destructive, and everything else between and so on. It very much seems that these creatures have been able to adapt and thrive in just about any environment they are put in, creating a global ecosystem that seems to be strong enough to withstand the test of both evolution and time. In short, the world feels alive and very much real to many. However, with this said, it should be noted that, when stacked up against reality, there is a slight problem with this picturesque landscape. There are way, way too few species to be truly considered realistic. Yes, for many, nearly 900 at the time of this video's construction does seem like a lot, but in the real world, there are millions of species of life forms on this planet. Some even suspect that the number may be as high as a trillion. Now, that is a large margin of error to be sure, and that is due to a number of factors that make it difficult to determine just how varied life really is on this planet, including discerning different species from one another, working with the large and very small scales that life exists at, and the very criteria that define what a species is even recognized as, among other factors. But even at the lowest ballpoint numbers, that is still far, far in excess of whatever number of Pokémon could ever be discovered in the world, given how the rollout has been between regions over time. And I know what you're thinking, that Pokemon is just a fantasy. It's not supposed to be realistic. And yes, you are right. Even with that said, however, there are important implications to this that do need to be noted, because science and real-world studies are the bread and butter of my work. And here, there are some issues that need to be addressed, and why the issues to even begin with. First of all, let's tackle the subject of diversity itself. Why is it something that needs to be taken into account? Within environments that can support life, there are what we call niches, or specific roles that they fill within the overall ecosystem of an area. These niches are what allow for specialization among different organisms, taking on distinct forms and capabilities that enable them to thrive in these specific purposes and populate, leading them to create stable numbers as they grow and develop as a species. Both directly and indirectly, these purposes interact with each other in a number of different ways, as predator and prey, mutual association, parasitism, and so on and so forth. They create an ecosystem that thrives from the combined work of its individual members, changing the environment in some cases, or at the very least, capitalizing on it to the point of making it truly and literally come alive. The real world and the Pokemon world both share these attributes, each having its own niche in the environment and creating a stable place where individual species and groups can coexist and thrive together. On this basis, You'd think it would be easy then, for all of this to work well, and stay stable for the most part. However, there is a crucial issue that needs to be addressed that is connected directly to the diversity and what it means for the global ecosystem as a whole. The food chain. I'm sure we all learned what a food chain is in school, but to be quick about it, a food chain refers to the succession of prey and predators that link together to support an entire ecosystem. In short, we have plants normally at the bottom of the chain, followed upwards by herbivores, and then whatever eats them, and possibly then whatever eats that predator, and so on and so forth. The chain continues on like this, until it reaches the peak predator that has no natural predators of itself, and as a whole, the interconnectedness of everything 
tends to make it more of a food web than a food chain, but that's not the point of what we are here to discuss right now. This is how all ecosystems operate in some form or another, and it helps to make it possible for all sorts of life to find its niche in a given environment and a place that can help diversify the food chain into a food web, and in turn give us something to hold base on. But it is noted that the interconnectedness needs to have plenty to it that can keep things going and maintain a stable state, and often requires creatures that are adapted to specific environments that can serve that environment in specific and not just in general, and why that is will be discussed shortly. When you take a look at the Pokemon world in general, while there are many species that may only be found in certain parts of the world, for the most part, a lot of Pokemon can be found in various places across the globe, and some might even be distributed globally by default. And yes, I'm sure that in a lot of places, this is fine, as they all work together to form a stable food web of sorts that keeps an environment happy and healthy. However, with that said, there is a problem with the global Pokemon ecosystem as a whole. It isn't necessarily the fault of the natural world itself, nor is it a problem that is ubiquitously human error. No, it is something much more obvious. Variety, namely, the lack of. As I said before, there are hundreds of types of Pokemon known to exist, but the real world has countless numbers of species of life forms known, and likely far more that are unknown. In looking at the two, it can be seen that there is likely a lot of overlap between areas of the globe as to what types of creatures occupy certain types of niches and places in the overall food web of an area, and this overlap, even if the ecology of a certain area is stable, spells potential disaster in the face of the kind of things that can make entire species extinct, and shows clearly why genetic diversity is absolutely necessary for life to thrive in any circumstance. The entire point of genetic diversity in the real world is to allow organisms to adapt over generations to different environments and to make more frequent the traits that will make an organism more likely to survive in a given environment. This is how evolution works at the level of a population, with selected traits that make one more successful at survival given ecological circumstances and in turn more likely to pass those traits down to their offspring. Like the environment they are a part of though, this is not a fixed feature in the slightest. Just because a species is able to adapt to and populate an area in a given moment of time, it does not mean that they will be able to do so forever. With time, all things will eventually change. This change can come in many forms, such as a change in the climate locally or even globally, the introduction of invasive species that interfere with the local food web, or even disease that targets specific creatures and could potentially wipe out an entire lineage if they are susceptible to it. And these are just a few examples. This is why having millions of species is important, because with so many, it is likely that, no matter what the change may be, someone is going to survive, or at least has the capacity to adapt to the change and survive. And this is where the world of Pokemon as we see it in popular media is in trouble. Climate change and invasive species are nothing new, sure, but what about something like disease? With so many creatures occupying similar niches across the globe, what would happen if one just went completely extinct because such a change occurred? being so widespread that it's a ripple that could affect a great deal of ecosystems if such a change became global, and the shaking of the tree of life from such an elimination could be much greater over a large area than the loss of one species might affect the real world. In short, the ecological state of the world of Pokemon is much more vulnerable to potentially global changes in its native populations than the real world. And that instability is an even bigger problem in a world filled with ordinary legendary Pokemon that could shape and destroy the world far more easily than humans ever could. And that's saying something given our track record on the subject. Now you might be asking yourself just how exactly the global ecology of the Pokemon world got to this point, and the answer might be a lot easier to see than you might otherwise think. In truth, the ubiquitous nature of Pokemon types across the world, and the seeming lack of anything we could consider even vaguely normal for our world, may simply be due to the fact that they have adapted forms that enable them to survive in the world without needing high genetic variation to survive in different environments. Such a notion might be difficult to grasp, but in truth, we have an example of just this in the real world. And it's us. We've managed to find ways to survive in just about any type of environment that we can find, barring extreme examples, and while we may have done it through technology and human determination, the case could be made that Pokemon do the very same thing, just from a purely biological standpoint. On the one hand, this is remarkable that they have found forms that can accomplish such a task, 
but it is still quite worrisome as the lack of genetic variety does still make them vulnerable to a host of potential changes and disasters and, in the case of something like a global pandemic, it could spell the end of an entire species of family of Pokemon, and this has happened before. Fossil Pokemon in particular are a great example of this, though we have managed to bring back quite a few with mixed to positive results. Being able to conquer multiple environments of different subtle forms is wonderful, yes, but the risks it carries are still great. Now, thankfully, this does not mean that the world of Pokemon is completely devoid of things that can help counter this issue. In fact, there are at least two parts of the world as we know it that help to make these issues a bit easier to work with. For one thing, there is a simple fact that Pokemon can evolve and change to match new surroundings and environments as they too change. Evolution is a fundamental component to the way that Pokemon grow and develop, and while many evolutions are simply the natural progression of child to adult, some can only be induced through items like evolutionary stones and held items. These radical and sudden mutations can grant Pokemon greater power than they ever had before, and in turn, serve as a way for them to become more fit for a wider range of environments, or otherwise become more capable of survival in a given area. However, it is noted that this does not always work in the way intended. As just said, many of these evolutions are just part of the life cycle of many Pokemon, so it doesn't actually change what they can and cannot tolerate in all cases. The mechanism is still better than nothing, though Pokemon that lack the capacity to evolve are still in some trouble in this context. The second thing that Pokemon have managed to come across in evolution are regional variants. While they might not be as widespread as many would think, regional variants of Pokemon that have different type assignments, powers, and abilities do show that Pokemon can adapt to many different types of environments and thrive in them even when they are not the typical fare for the species. As of recording, there really aren't a lot of them out there, but they are still numerous enough for the possibilities to be tantalizing. Some of them might only be suitable shifts that are a consequence of differing soil content, such as in the case of Galarian Stunfisk. Others, like the members of the Sandshrew, Vulpix, and Darumaka families, change type radically to adapt to freezing cold environments, and the results are quite fascinating given that their standard forms are known for occupying much warmer climates, with ground and fire type powers normally being their bread and butter. It is quite likely that there are many other regional variants out there that have yet to be discovered, but the ones we do have still help to show the flexibility of the genetic attributes of Pokemon, though in the end, even with these variants, the issue of diversity is still present in the numbers themselves. As a whole, the world of Pokemon is one that is vulnerable to disaster, with just the absence of a few species because of their global presence and it would seem like they would not be the kind of creatures that could last long under the thumb of the natural world with the types of disasters it can bring to reality. But I won't leave you here on a note of doom and gloom, because there thankfully is a solution to all of this. And oddly enough, it is a solution that requires just a small leap of faith and already shows precedent for being the truth even in the Pokemon anime. The way to stabilize the world webs of the world and the overall global ecology? Treat the world as if both Pokemon and real world life forms exist together simultaneously. I know this sounds a bit odd to some, but in all honesty, it makes sense and really should be a given at this point. The fact that humans exist in the world of Pokemon is the first big clue that this is likely the reality at hand. Plants are another easy leap, as we clearly see basic grasses, trees, flowers, and all sorts of berry plants as part of this world. From there, animals are not that much farther to work with, and given that real-world animals are repeatedly mentioned in Pokédex entries for many species, it is safe to assume that most, if not all of the life forms we see in the real world around us, are a part of the Pokémon world as well. The addition of extra species helps cushion the blow in case one goes extinct, mitigating the impact of such a loss through the sheer number of life forms that could be found in the real world. From that perspective, then, it would seem that Pokémon are only differentiated from the creatures they share their ecosystems with by their combat abilities, but that touches more on what exactly defines and identifies a creature as a Pokemon, and that is a far more extensive and difficult subject to tackle, and will be saved for a separate analysis. With this inclusion of the real world though, the entire situation could likely be balanced and hopefully rectified, even if it might be something that needs to be properly applied on a case-by-case -case basis. In conclusion, at face value, the world of Pokemon is one that would seem to be in a dangerous ecological state where the balance is delicate enough that the elimination of just a handful of species could potentially throw some ecosystems out of whack and down a potentially dangerous path. But, 
With the inclusion of reality and the creatures you can normally find outside of your front doorstep, we can see a fuller, brighter world, more than capable of sustaining itself and working as an ecological situation where life can thrive and continue onwards even in the face of loss. The world of Pokemon is a vast one, and there's no telling what else might be out there to study regarding the ecology of the world, but that will have to wait for another time. For now, I thank you and bid you farewell, and I will see you all again in the next episode of the VTP. Thank you all for watching this video. It is always a pleasure to help teach others about the world of Pokemon and the many facets of it that exist in both the world we call home and the world they call home. If you'd like, please leave a comment and subscribe and ring the bell to this channel to get regular updates on content and anything else that might be going on. You can find me and my written work on DeviantArt under the name Utitis and be informed of information and content uploads on my Twitter page and my Patreon page. Donations are always welcome. Always remember, the world of Pokemon is a vast and varied place, and there's no telling what secrets might be hiding just around the corner. So keep watch, stay vigilant, and always prepare for the unexpected. Until next time, have a wonderful rest of the day.